Is that good? Yep. All right. So let's jump straight into it. Um, I, I titled this module Sustainability Metrics and the Urban Scale, and uh, and that's to that's to do two things really. It's to think about metrics in terms of what they are, what they can do for us as uh, as scholars who are studying transformation in different forms, but also to put emphasis on what's special about these at the urban scale when we're thinking of cities and transformation, to what extent do metrics enter the picture and why? And, uh, and I think a good place to start is with a definition. I think of metrics as measurements that have been privileged as standards, which means that they're not, they're not just questions of social material change. They are actually manifestations of socio-political agreements of, uh, of agreeing as society to understand a particular phenomenon, a particular kind of social material phenomenon um, through the kinds of data that we have available and that we choose to use. And that means that we're, we're thinking of urban sustainability metrics as a desirable form of urban development that we've agreed on certain things that we would like to see happening in cities as you know, a, a general move in the right direction. And, um, and in that sense, transformations then rely on metrics because it's not only that we have certain targets or indicators, it's also that we have infrastructure in place that can capture particular kinds of data for us to monitor, um, to evaluate whether we are actually hitting those indicators, whether we're moving towards certain targets. And, um, and if, if that's how we understand metrics, then there are some characteristics of, uh, of a metrics that it can be successful in terms of being useful. Um, one is that it should be ambitious and yet feasible. So it's not, not much use having a metric that, you know, a target that we've already achieved because it doesn't change very much. Um, so it has to be ambitious, but if it's too ambitious and not realistic enough, we're not going to be able to get policy traction to be able to mobilize different actors to actually try and achieve it because nobody's going to take it seriously. Um, and because of the kind of uh, pressure, the urgency of mitigating and adapting to climate change, we need to have quite rapid urban transformations, but there's, this also entails the risk of leaving some people behind. So we want targets that are geared towards rapid change, but also um, towards making this change inclusive and also actually making it quite deep and lasting so that we can continue for quite a while. These are not, um, urban sustainability is not something that we can say will be done and dusted within the next few years. Um, and, and another, there's not a comprehensive list, but I think these are some useful ways to think about it. Metrics should capture complex change, multi-dimensional change quite accurately and at the same time enable wide coverage. So we're talking about being comprehensive in different ways. One is how much we can get into granularity into the disaggregate and the other is at the aggregate scale that we need to take, uh, take the whole picture into account. And these are challenging tasks and you might say from all the modules we've had on the course that, that cities make this possible, right? And that right indicates that we haven't, we've had sort of uneasy conversations around the extent to which cities are drivers of desirable development or not. And, and I'm going to argue today that metrics are a good way to be able to problematize that, to engage with that, in, uh, with that question in a constructive way. And the way I've organized this uh, for the next 15, 20 minutes is to look at a couple of examples of two things that are quite key when we think about urban transformation, but also that are key in terms of how I see metrics as contributing and as being relevant to us as, uh, as applied researchers, scholars who are interested in urban sustainability. One is to look at, at the mitigation of social vulnerability. And uh, vulnerability comes in many forms, uh, given that we have a focus on climate and energy here. I thought it would be nice to talk about a particular form of um, energy vulnerability or energy poverty and how we can alleviate that. So by energy poverty, there are several definitions. One that I quite like um, comes from uh, Stefan Buzerovsky and uh, Saskia Petrova and colleagues who talk about it as an inadequate access to, uh, to the basic energy needs of the household. 
And often energy poverty is talked about in relation to the household as a unit of analysis. But uh, it's, quite, it's quite widespread. We use energy for thermal comfort, for well-being within the home. We use it for um, um, basic things like lighting and powering appliances. But we also use it outside the space of the household. Increasingly, there's a focus on transport energy poverty, so um, energy that's uh, tied into the mobility needs of a household. And um, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the kind of metrics that, uh, that we see at the urban scale um, in relation to energy poverty. And then another example I wanted to take is very centrally part of the, the ecological transition that we're concerned with, uh, the urban low carbon transition. And here I think metrics can help us to get into the fascinating question of concretizing urban targets of how do certain commitments become institutionalized and what role do cities play within that towards a low carbon future. And, um, and then I just want to, having gone into a couple of examples, I want to zoom out a little bit and, uh, and draw on a couple of the, the texts for this course that go into some geographical concepts that I think are really interesting, both in terms of how they help us to think about the socio-spatial drivers and effects of urban transformation, but also to problematize the kind of claims that are made about urban change and what, and what we understand as a transformation in terms of the actual infrastructure that's involved in that shifting. So let's step into the, the first uh, example. And this draws on the first uh, of the four texts for this module, um, where six of us present a framework with five dimensions for what we call energy poverty metrology research or research on, on the metrics of energy poverty. And uh, this is coming out of work that we've been doing over the last three years uh, as part of a cost action, which is a network on European energy poverty. It's a network with uh, more than 200 members across 38 countries. So we have had quite, quite a rich set of inputs on on how to think about energy poverty. It's uh, focused on Europe, and we're aware that this uh, manifests in even more different ways in other parts of the world. But even within Europe, there's been um, you know, questions of whether, for instance, with thermal comfort in the house, we're talking about heating or also cooling, and how do we capture that? And there are some national databases, there are indicators on, on income and livelihoods and living conditions. Um, there are national indicators on that, that help us, and, and a lot of them, if you want to look at them, you can find on the website of the European Energy Poverty Observatory, EPOV as well. Um, but what I'm interested in here, and what's really been uh, quite exciting um, coming out of the network, is, is to see some of the new indicators that we can come up with um, to, to map energy poverty. And many of these actually are things we encounter at the urban scale. And I'll get into that in a moment, but let's look at what these, these five dimensions are. So if you start at the top of the figure, you have a historical trajectories. It's very different how we understand energy poverty in say Ireland or um, the UK, where this conversation has gone back to, uh, to the 80s and 90s uh, at least, um, compared to places like Spain and Portugal, where it's really within the last decade or even just the last uh, few years that energy poverty has become an agenda item in energy policy. And so the historical trajectories of, uh, of this kind of significance of energy poverty within energy policy have really shaped energy poverty metrics, the extent to which relevant data have actually been captured and are taken up within policy processes in, in any given context. And then if you think about how, how you enact metrology, how do we actually work with choosing metrics, um, and this is a, a socio-politically modulated process, it's through different institutions, but the core question, we argue, is one of, of a trade-off between, on the one hand, data flattening, because we want to capture as much as we can at the aggregate scale. We want to be able to, for instance, look at rural and urban contexts in a whole country, so there's a limit to how much richness there can be to data. But the other, the flip side of this is contextualized identification. We want to really understand in a situated way what the lived real reality of energy poverty is in any given context. So somewhere as a compromise between these two tendencies, we 
agree upon metrics that are both ambitious as well as feasible, right? And then if you go to the lowest uh, step, which is what we call reconfiguring metrics, then we see that there is the, there is direct policy uptake where there's appetite for some of the metrics that come out of uh, historical trajectories and out of this uh, negotiation between data flattening and contextualized identification. But there's also forms of new representation that come up. So we have ideas on metrics that could work to capture a problem like energy poverty, especially when it has only become recently recognized as an issue that requires attention in many countries. Um, and so then there's the question of how do you get how do you get policy uptake of these new metrics and just to take a couple of examples here um some of the most exciting work i think has been and we touch upon some of these examples in the paper um is around disconnection events in in barcelona where we see that in spain it, and they have millions of disconnection events for people who haven't been able to pay their electricity bills so they're in arrears are cut off by the utility now this is a great indicator of energy poverty because these are households often elderly people who really can't afford to be without electricity and heating in the winter because they're quite vulnerable in other ways um, this is an example that they've been able to move on in Barcelona because there's density. Cities make possible a certain concentration and so also being able to provide services to urban citizens in ways that might be much harder where density is, is lower um, for the population. And, uh, and another example without going into detail yet is, is on the district heating or grid heating in Bucharest. It's infamously bad. It's uh, in need of a lot of uh, repair and maintenance and the European Union, the Commission has been actually funding quite a lot of um, maintenance work on, on the utility here. But, uh, but at the same time, there's ways in which you can map this by crowdsourcing um, the metric of where the heating is not working in which households down every street. And so they've come up with a layer on Google Maps that people are able to feed in by themselves. And this is quite different than what the utility shows in its own performance on which households are getting um, heating from the district grid and which ones are just paying into it without without being able to benefit. So this is really about uh, energy democracy in terms of people power being able to represent um, the real condition that you're experiencing um, of thermal comfort in the home. And another example is um, is on socialized tariffs in Lisbon. I think I'll I'll come back to Lisbon um, later on because I want to make sure I stay within time. Sorry about a bit of background noise here. Here you see a couple of examples from the work we've been doing in, uh, in Barcelona, in Bucharest. So at the top, you see um, a bunch of us from a training school last year sitting together with a community in, in Barcelona in a neighborhood where there were really poor conditions of electricity just in terms of the reliability of the maintenance of the, the grid um, in a quite poor neighborhood uh, within the central city. And they had an electric fire because of which a person died and a, a house a family lost its uh, home and uh, and we visited this site and uh, then we spoke with the community about the struggles they'd had to try and get justice for this for instance compensation for the loss of life for the loss of uh, livelihoods for the mental trauma and how difficult that had been and they had insisted prior to um, this fire event that they needed some of uh, the wires to be um, to be safer and better and uh, and so it's it's really a process of claim making, right? And if you have metrics of energy poverty that would capture the need for safety, for adequate access, um, then then we would see um, a safer energy environment, but also one where where people in poorer neighborhoods don't experience energy in a completely different and inequitable way compared to a, let's say a posh locality within the same city. And in the images below, you see a visit to the, the district heating plant uh, in Bucharest, uh, where we also heard from the company how it was uh, making progress on, um, on improving its infrastructure and services. And then on the right side, you see us sitting with several of the um, community players who've been quite active in, uh, in the idea that they, there should be more accountability, that they should be able to demand better quality services for which they're paying um, for instance, for uh, for household heating from the district uh, grid. And I mentioned the example um, that they've been able to represent their concerns uh, in a way that's publicly accessible and down to the household level. 
So these are some examples that we see coming out of cities. I want to move over to Lisbon and, uh, and jump into the second case, um, which is around low carbon urban transformations. And here you'll see a, a car charging port that's a bit different in terms of its upkeep than the one you might remember from our, our video launching this course. Um, Lisbon is a gritty city. It's one that's been through an economic uh, recession from 2008 to 2015. Um, and yet it's one that's really high on its uh, low carbon transition ambitions. On the right at the bottom corner, you see an image from a conference I was at, a national conference that looked at the implications of the energy transition. And I'll get into in a moment how how Portugal has really thrown down the gauntlet for being able to move to a very low carbon society as a country, but how this is really being led from the capital, from Lisbon. So at the top, you have an image from, uh, from when Oslo was the European green capital back in 2019. And this is all of the team from Lisbon 2020 that was taking over the mantle of European green capital this year. So they were on stage in Oslo um, at the Urban Future uh, Global Conference last year a conference that was supposed to be in Lisbon and was canceled this spring because of the global pandemic. But if we look at, uh, at what it means to concretize urban low carbon targets uh, in relation to Lisbon, then I want to take you into a table um, that might be familiar from the second uh, text for this course. And that is really looking at, um, at sustainability transitions in terms of accountability and in terms of networked governance, thinking of cities as actors, both located within a region, within a country, but also located within a larger global network, uh, for instance, a network of cities, but also of, of material production and material flows. And, um, and I talk uh, about this along with uh, my colleague, uh, Jacob Grandin, in a paper on European green capitals, uh, where we compare Oslo and Lisbon. And, uh, and say that if you look at the particular commitments that these cities make towards sustainability, then we could ask to what extent these are hollow or substantive, to what extent um, is this discourse um, just about putting in place targets or also then chasing them up. And so we, we say that at the local scale, the discourse can be performative in terms of saying, okay, we do have a commitment to sustainability that's already um, that's already something, but it could be hollow um, just as a branding tool where there's not really any justification for why some aspects are prioritized over others. It could also be substantiated where the basis for highlighting some aspects is actually provided. And here we think of this as something that's then catalyzing change or orchestrating change, bringing different actors together in, in support of, um, of particular targets. An example here is uh, speaking with uh, somebody from the, uh, the energy agency of the city of Lisbon, who said, you know, being, being a European green capital, one of the, the things it makes possible is, and we were sitting um, in, in the, the city hall, is that the papers on the fourth floor can move up to the ninth floor faster because it's a pilot, because it's an experiment, because we're doing it as part of the part of the the European green capital rather than as a business as usual exercise. Um, but then there's also questions, and, and we critique this in the paper, there's questions of the translocal scale that goes beyond the city, um, either outside its immediate borders or also in terms of material flows elsewhere in the world, um, coming in or going out, where we talk about this in terms of telecoupling. Um, here are the socio-spatial effects of what is consumed in the city, and we've gone into this in a previous module, are these hidden or are they glossed over in the material choices? Or do cities then see urban sustainability transitions as, as something they do within a translocal assemblage, as something where they are actually factoring these material choices into their socio-spatial location situation within, uh, within a global society? And, and to think of this with the, as Lisbon within the national scale, we could think of, uh, of some commitments that have been made by Portugal in the last year or two. On, they have a national energy and climate plan 2030, which envisions ambitious change, uh, for instance, on, on solar energy, which is uh, what I focus on in Portugal, um, up to 10 gigawatts of solar, um, of solar energy capacity installed within the next decade. And there's something they've already moved on. They set a new uh, world record for the lowest uh, tariffs for solar auctions last year. And they have the second round in process right now. Um, this record has already been broken a couple of times since then. 
this is how fast the solar sector moves globally. And then also in terms of a carbon neutrality roadmap where they've articulated a vision as a country for moving towards a really, really low carbon society over the next three decades in line with the Paris Agreement and, uh, and, and climate targets. But just to bring it back to the city scale again, I want to mention what this makes possible at the local level in, in the capital in Lisbon, which then hosted last year a, an event on solar cities along with the UNDP and others. And, and we had coming out of this something called the Solar Mayors Club Charter. So now there's a new network called Solar Cities. And if you look up this charter, um, they aim to boost solar energy projects and citizen involvement in the energy transition by joining mayors from all the world together to sign this charter as an international declaration of mayors pushing for the adoption of solar powers in urban environments. And they specifically point out their role in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals 7 on energy and 11, which is to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And this is one that we'll get into in the hands-on workshop uh, around SDG 7 um, later in this module. And, um, and so we, could, we can see here that Lisbon has actually um, put in place its own target to show, to lead um, by sort of by doing, where they want to put eight megawatts of solar energy in place within the boundaries of the city, not just source it from from the region or from other parts of the country um, and be the great sort of consumer of energy, but put it up on buildings, feed it directly into the urban uh, metro um, transport, which works on a direct connection, a DC grid, so it's ideal for solar um, injections. So these are ways in which, again, cities are accelerating, concentrating the kind of transformations that we need towards low carbon um, futures. And I think metrics give us a really good way to a good point of entry into understanding how this change happens. We've talked about this uh, going all the way back to the, the start of the course with how we're talking about relational um, ways of looking at, uh, at, at change and at, uh, at network governance. So I, I thought it was uh, useful to come back to that here. But uh, just to link this with the, the third and fourth texts uh, that you had as part of, um, of this module, I wanted to say a couple of things before opening up the discussion about how we could connect geographical concepts and really within a very exciting field of energy geographies that's come of, uh, come of age in the last few years. Um, I, I thought it would, and how we can connect that with metrics and, and then I, and, and with my argument that we need, uh, we have quite a generative focus on metrics that, uh, that we can make use of as, uh, as people looking at uh, urban sustainability transformations. So there's a paper that is one of my favorites that's uh, by Gavin Bridge and colleagues. Um, and I think it's useful in terms of, uh, the, it offers six concepts that help us to think through drivers and effects of urban transformations or really of low carbon transformations at, at any scale in socio-spatially situated ways. But if we want to anchor ourselves at the urban scale, then they are useful nonetheless because we want to think of the urban scale in relation to the others. And, uh, and really they, they talk about the need to attend to spatial difference, the need to relate or to pay attention to the relations between position and connection. And this is both in a material sense, but also in the cognitive domain, also in terms of the, the connections between different kinds of situated actors. And then to think about spatial configuration and scales of organization. And here, just to sort of make real what this is, to make it tangible, think about something like the electricity grid that, that extends over a whole country and often across borders between countries. But at the very local level, at the distribution network, how, what is the quality of this grid? What is the, the content it's delivering? Where is it possible to inject energy back into this grid? What does this do um, to the ability of different stakeholders to be part of an energy transition, to benefit from it or, or to contribute to it? And who is deciding this? And often these decisions are made in the corridors of power in cities, and they're not necessarily as informed by the rural realities, if you like, or the realities of, of peripheries and not just in a, so, in a spatial sense, but as we've discussed before, in complex patterning um, of, uh, of socio-spatial um, um, topographies. So, so that's, that's one thing that, uh, that I urge you to think about in relation to that feeling. 
And then uh, going into the fourth paper, I thought it was uh, a line from it that I'll come to. It, I thought it was a really useful way um, to problematize claims on, on how we know. Um, how do we know about the nature of urban infrastructural change? Is this actually a sustainability transformation or not? I've talked about this a bit in relation to accountability and uh, and local and translocal and whether something is whether targets are substantive or not. But um, that Harriet Bulkley and colleagues here talk um, just the concluding part of their paper, and I quote, says, the material politics of infrastructure emerge as much in the socio-political negotiations they demand as in the technical deployment of physical networks. Here they're quoting uh, Jonathan Rutherford's uh, work from 2014. Yet this is not a politics that gives rise to rupture or dissent. Rather, it is manifest in an ongoing negotiation, a quiet contestation, compromise, and attrition of different positions through which new kinds of grid, urban, energy, climate realities are forged, come to be comprom compromised and configured anew. And if what we're looking at with urban transformations is often not rupture or dissent, but rather ongoing negotiation, quiet contestation, compromise, and attrition, then I think that there's a case to be made for a geography of metrics as being agents of change or stabilization. And that as scholars who want to understand urban transformation towards sustainability or not, that we would do well to attend in real time to both how metrics are produced, how they are reconfigured, but also how they are deployed in entanglement in recursive relation with actual social material change in our cities and governed from our cities. And I have some thoughts on this out in a, a paper now ca called Metrics for an Accountable Energy Transition. If, uh, if you like a look, you can visit that later on. So, um, Thanks for your attention, and I think we can slide into conversations. Okay, may I start? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, it was really interesting to me. I want to show you your one picture and then I want to then add my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the picture. Uh, I have a quick question. What do you think about this uh, solar panel on this building? Is it ugly? Is it, uh, how do you feel if you think such a building in an urban area? Um, are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I think I think it uh, it's something that uh, that we need to get our head around. I'm reminded of a, a story which is when I visited a Chinese uh, solar module manufacturing factory in Lisbon or in Portugal, um, in a rural part of Portugal, and uh, and they said that most of their production because they're quite small, they can't compete on cost with the giga factories. They said most of their demand comes from uh, places like the Nordic countries because they can spend a little more on. Uh, on sexing up their panels so that they look nice and sleek and black and uh, belong in a Nordic setting and people are willing to pay more for that. Yeah, so <laughs> this building is for Stavanger. Uh, this guy has installed this uh, uh, solar panel on his uh, building and the municipality uh, has uh, kind of forced him to take this panel out from his building. And I was exactly wanted to talk about this, uh, about this politician, you know, people, even in some city like Serangir, I'm quite sure that there are a lot of people who are willing to do such, such a thing, to install solar panels and use this renewable energy. But it's all about this politician regulation. There are still a lot of uh, hindrance in front of yeah. them, you know. And yeah. I exactly want to talk, you know, people are willing to, help uh, to contribute to this uh, urban energy transition, but still there are a lot of uh, hindrance in this way. And what do you think about this? I exactly what you think. Thanks, think, that's a great question. If I can, um, uh, if I, I, I can. I just wanted to point out for those who might not uh, uh, read Norwegian that, that yeah. it says that before the end of July, um, this person needs to take out uh, the solar panels. Otherwise there's, well, it's a thousand kroner fine. 
every day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If I can, uh, I think this is interesting. Can you scroll back up to the picture, please? Uh, yep. so it, but it also speaks to, to I think, sort of the core of Sid's, Sid's interest uh, or concern presented in the lecture. I mean, how we define certain things matter for how we evaluate them. Uh, if you look carefully at the picture, he also has a satellite dish. And if you ask me, <laughs> if I was a politician, I might say, that's ugly. <laughs> that should be removed. But it's, it's, there's something about how we... Like solar panels are now, they're coming online, either being installed, right? And, and now we see them as kind of a, a, an intrusion uh, into sort of the visual imagery of, of our cities. Um, while as something like a solar, no, a, a satellite dish, which this guy also has, uh, is something that we're quite, quite used to. You know, we define that it's, it's been defined within the normal. So, uh, so I think that's quite interesting uh, how, yeah, I, I imagine that in this neighborhood where this guy is living in Stavanger is the Norwegian oil city and where it's quite, it's in the middle of these politics of this of tension between, you know, uh, the oil economy versus the new green economy, etc. To take a, a contrasting example from Bergen and not to play up Bergen in this uh, instance, <laughs> but, uh, but last week we had um, a new build of 14 buildings. We had five of them sold for um, close to a million uh, dollars each, um, where, where along with the 14 buildings, the developer has put in a, a bunch of Nissan Leaf uh, Second Life uh, car batteries, which have gone down 20% in efficiency, so they're not very useful as car batteries, um, but they've put them in and put solar panels on all of these uh, new um, new house houses and uh, and they've been really successful at selling them at a high price despite uh, the real estate market potentially being a bit lower because of uh, the pandemic right now and um, and they attribute part of that success to having gone with the new wave of new technology so um, so it's also about how it's branded and the solar and the batteries are charging from the solar panels and selling back to the smart grid when the prices are high so they're making quite a bit of money and this also raises questions of who's actually benefiting from, um, from this particular kind of development. So the metrics we have for, let's say, urban solar energy install, uh, installation doesn't necessarily, is not sensitive to um, whether it's equitably distributed across different income classes. Yeah. Good. We should open for uh, other questions as well. Um, are there others who have questions or comments? I thought maybe, I don't know if it's appropriate, but um, to share some experiences from having been part of a project where we tried to actually develop indicators. And um, yes, it was for national government in South Africa, and I'm sure context is a bit different in that budgets are smaller, time frames are tight. Um, so you kind of have to do a quick half-baked job to some extent. Um, so we were a team from the University of uh, Interdisciplinary Academics and we had a year part-time to develop national indicators to track South Africa's progress on climate change and I think it was a project that yeah has been the most challenging that I've experienced to date and that probably almost broke me to some extent. Uh, just the burden of, of trying to figure these things out. And so we tried to go, we started off trying to do a kind of complex systems approach where we wanted to try and show also the interconnections. And as you all probably know, academics like to talk. So we spent months talking about the different possibilities and got completely lost in this, in this complex systems approach. Um, and what we ended up with in the end was a kind of, was dividing it up into six narratives. So we had kind of, what are the six stories that we want to tell? And then we had a number of between sort of um, 10 and 20 indicators under each narrative. And then we tried to show the interconnections by telling a story of what those indicators were showing. Um, 
I don't know how well we did in the end, but I think it's a good starting point. Um, but, um, but I mean, some of the challenges, just like the practical challenges is to really think about, and especially I guess when, the in, when politicians are not involved in the process directly, uh, it's what are the stories that you want the indicators to tell? Um, and that's quite a politically sensitive um, thing. Um, so part of it, I guess, is to show whether we're going the right way or not and thereby trigger evaluations that could look at why we're not going the right way in terms of, of how things are developing. Um, and I think the mitigation related indicators are a lot easier uh, than the more socially related indicators, the things related to adaptive capacity, et cetera, are a lot harder um, to capture. Um, so having been kind of involved in the practical aspects of indicators, I have to say it's something that I found, yeah, incredibly, incredibly difficult to do in practice. Yeah, thanks for sharing that observation. It's, um, it's been a, a, a recurrent theme in our work on developing indicators for uh, energy poverty in Europe. This question of what is, uh, what is sort of appropriate as a, comprehensive generalizable package and we've uh, we haven't actually tried very hard to do that across all countries because the realities are so different even within one global region like Europe that it seems that ultimately it's only a meaningful exercise if you can think of what can get policy uptake within a given national context um, and sometimes the scale at which that uptake is required is not the national it's the urban it's uh, it's particular kinds of actors that are distributed across space and it's not always the same institutions that are necessarily in charge of it either. So it's also trying to get get our head out of uh, this, you know, being wrapped up in what kind of national databases do we need? Maybe maybe different problems need different kinds of solutions. And then that brings up the question of how that reorganizes um, authority. Who is in charge? Who is accountable for addressing an issue like energy poverty or climate change? And, uh, and there, there's interesting questions that have come up throughout this course, I think, on the role that cities can play. But certainly, I think there's um, an, in a useful literature on polycentric climate governance that uh, goes into questions of different kinds of overlapping domains of authority across institutions. I think part of the problem is often that climate change sits in the Department of Environment in a lot of places like in South Africa and they have very little budget and very little authority of other departments so they can highlight things and they can recommend things but they cannot tell others what to do. This also changes in the, the Portuguese case and I've been uh, looking at it for the last few years and, and similarly in Spain a couple of years ago, they actually changed the en the energy portfolio from being something that sat under the um, finance ministry to something that was combined with the environment portfolio. And they actually created a new ministry of environment and energy transition. So we see institutional change at the national scale in sort of, you could say, the most significant of ways. And these are not isolated instances, um, but it's it's worth looking at and learning from and seeing whether that actually helps get people talking exactly in the ways you're saying across the kind of departments that don't necessarily do enough together. Any other questions or comments? I think we'll take one more before we take a break. Okay, so I have one more thing to say. Uh, I think we have a similar uh, situation to what Katinka said uh, about the Ministry of Environment being the main uh, advocate or the main uh, driver for climate change actions, but actually uh, within the Ministry of Energy itself, uh, there has been conflicting uh, policies. So uh, it's not only about the, the two different ministries are having different uh, approaches to climate change. It's the same ministry and they are having differences in between. Um, so they made the tariff for uh, solar energy uh, a couple of years back. Uh, 
and then uh, the currency flotation happened. This tariff was not revisited after afterwards, which made the payback period for for solar uh, power plants uh, longer. Uh, this is a problem in itself, but we are still going on with it. On the other hand, uh, the energy companies are, are still building a new conventional energy power plants. So there are, although we have targets, there are still conflicting uh, decisions being made within the same entity, not just within other entities. And I think it's um, to. To me, it seems that recognizing the political economy that one is dealing with in a particular context is uh, has to be part of uh, part of the starting point for what we study and what we push for um, from from research. Um, we we did this um, cross. We did a study of fifteen states in India on electricity distribution. It's called Mapping Power, and there's a book out if you're interested. And there we argued that it's really worth seeing energy dis electricity distribution as inherently political and politicized and if we acknowledge that then then we can think about the kinds of change that's possible both to increase efficiency and to in increase energy access and so on um, but but because it's kind of prima facie denied but then um, sort of talked about informally um, it prevents us from getting at some of the questions that really need to be dealt with, which is exactly um, having, for instance, the finance ministry and the energy ministry or the state nodal agencies <coughs> talk to each other about um, how to get out of a particular hole that they might be in. And yeah, it's, I think metrics can be helpful um, to, to make that kind of conversation possible because they ground the challenge in sometimes in numerical terms, but as Katinka said, it, not everything is easy, easily quantifiable or not everything is equally uh, quantifiable and made commensurable. So um, to take one example at the urban scale, the kind of exercise of carbon budgeting that uh, we've been seeing now in places like Bergen and Oslo, that's, uh, that's trying to actually get, get our bearings on what are the carbon emissions that the municipality itself can control. And we find that it's an, a tiny number. It's significant in the absolute amount of emissions, but of the total emissions coming out of a city like Bergen, the municipality doesn't actually have control over more than 90% of it, right? Not directly, but could we, for instance, institute measures that, you know, is there regulation possible on what supermarkets can import or not? Um, at, what, at what scale do those regulations need to be put into place if they have to be institutionalized at the national level through uh, through national legislation then the urban scale might not be the place to look but if we want to measure carbon budgets for cities for instance with electrifying our um, our um, uh, ferries which we're doing and we're sort of world leading on in this region in western norway then do we also account for the displacement of what we currently have in place where do those where do those ferries go and we don't because it's not only a problem of year to year accounting it's a problem of accounting over a long time span and we don't have the baseline for that because we haven't done this before so as soon as you get into into actually getting to grips with putting in place metrics you realize that there's things that are overlooked and when you can surface those problems you open up the basis for a different kind of conversation so I think even though I talked about the performative role of metrics in not only positive terms, I think even when they're hollow, they haven't been substantiated in terms of action. I think those metrics also play a useful purpose if we can challenge them from academia and from others, from you know, practitioners who can see these gaps and say, well, if that's what you want to be doing, then you not only need to have, have sort of assessment, you also need to be able to have sanctions. There have to be winners and losers if you want to change the way things are. And otherwise, we're not talking about any real kind of transformation at all. Is that a good break. place to take a break? That's a good place to take a break, yeah. All right, so let's meet back at, uh, at 10.